Okay, why don't we begin uh, today's colloquium. So today's speaker is uh, Dr. Odile Coddington, and she received her PhD from University of Colorado in the Atmosphere and Oceanic Science Department in 2009, and since then she has been researcher at LASP. Her in research interests include the measurements and modeling of solar irradiance and the shortwave radiation at Earth observed from surface, air, and space. Uh, and this includes the measurement and modeling of solar irradiance, including the uh, development of solar irradiance climate data record, which she will talk about today. And she is also involved in the spectral irradiance monitor instrument that is part of the total and spectral irradiance satellite, which will be launched in uh, this year. And today she will talk about uh, the NOAA solar irradiance climate data record from modeling solar irradiance based on source observations to extending our understanding of solar irradiance variability with future TSIS observations. A mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the introduction, Nick. So this is, this is work that I have not done by myself. So um, uh, my primary colleague on these efforts is Judith Wayne of the Naval Research Laboratory. And I'd also want to thank, of course, the um, source and thesis scientists at LASP for which we're using their measurements and gearing for their future measurements. Um, the contributions, um, as I said, this solar radiance climate data record is, is funded by NOAA. <clears throat> uh, NASA has a big part in this as well because the Naval Research uh, Laboratory of Solar Variability Models um, were developed from the NASA source, uh, under the NASA source mission. So I just wanted to uh, begin with this um, short movie, which <clears throat> kind of establishes the motivation for this talk, where we understand that the, the variability and the magnetic flux produces solar radiance variability. Whoop, let me move this down here. I think I can, there we go. Sorry. And we know, understand that um, the vast majority of the solar irradiance um, reaching to Earth emerges from the photosphere, the lower atmosphere of the sun. And what I've shown on this time series here as this movie progressed was these images of the sun followed by traces of um, solar irradiance observations from the NASA source mission. We have uh, TSI from the TIM instrument in the top plot, and then <clears throat> several um, integrated regions uh, that have contributions from the source solstice instruments and the source sim instruments. And in, blee in green, excuse me, is, is the results of the model that I'm going to be talking about today and how that, basically how, how these magnetic features on the surface of the sun change the variability and our ability to measure and model that irradiance change. So as some background, I wanted just to briefly introduce some terms. So I'm going to be using the term Naval Research Laboratory, or NRL. And these are the solar variability models by Judith Lean. And we've turned them NRL TSI2 and NRL SSI2. And that number two refers to our updated model, version two. And the other thing I'm going to be mentioning is that it's this version two of these updated NRL models that are transitioned or have been transitioned to the NOAA Climate Data Record Program in 2015. So at last, we're operationally producing this modeled record. And it's publicly available. So the outline of my talk today is just to give a little bit more brief outline of this NOAA Climate Data Record Program talk also about the model formulation, what deliverables we provide with, as part of the climate data record, um, so our plans for uh, an upcoming revision, which is going to be version two, revision one. Then I'm going to spend most of the talk doing comparisons against um, observations. And these are observations by the source uh, mission. And then one other model, uh, satire model, to touch briefly on the quality assurance that we include in the climate data record. And the last half of the talk will be, or last third of the talk will be 
the upcoming TSIS mission and how we anticipate its role will shape our um, future estimates of, of this solar variability model. <clears throat> so the, the NOAA um, program, actually it's, it's called the National Centers for Environmental Information, or NCEI. It was formerly the National Climatic Data Center. Maybe more people are familiar with the term NCDC. A um, couple years ago, they had this name change. I'm not sure the reason why, but it's now, now NOAA NCEI, and they have formed a climate data record program. And <clears throat> um, Judith and Peter Pluski back in the day wrote a proposal that was accepted to um, produce a solar radiance, a climate data record. And back at the time, the um, idea was actually to, to provide the direct thesis observations as the climate data record supplemented to the past with this model. Um, but due to delays in the launch of the TSIS mission, we then are now producing just <coughs> model estimates for the time being. <laughs> and transitioning to the future will incorporate the TSIS observations. So <clears throat> the climate data record program there um, uh, uses the definition of the National Research Center, or excuse me, National Research Council of what a climate data record is being that it's a data record with the length, consistency, and continuity to be um, useful to broad user groups of uh, climate variability and change. So to be um, part of this program, we have to uh, commit to systematically generating the data, um, assessing it for quality, um, evaluating its robustness, its sustainability, and publica publications, um, that verify the, the de defensibility of the science in there. Um, <clears throat> this is the website of the climate, whoop, climate Data Record Program. And I've listed here just a few of the other climate data record pro pro uh, products that are available through this program. And you'll notice, for example, um, so we have at the top is uh, solar radiance, so we have the energy coming in. We've got the outgoing long wave radiation, so we have the outgoing uh, energy. We also have the transfer of radiation between the ocean and thank you, ocean and the atmosphere. And then we have um, atmospheric properties that um, scatter and absorb radiation, ozone clouds, aerosols. So. Um, so my point of this slide is, is just to show that uh, there's a, a number of products that are available for uh, users of atmospheric or scientific researchers of atmospheric climate variability and change. Okay, so let's talk about this model formulation of the Naval Research Laboratory model. It's a it's what's called a proxy model, um, where it, we're essentially uh, parameterizing, if you will, the the irradiance change that occurs from changes in magnetic features of the sun that um, are evidenced by dark and light patches on the, on the sun's surface. And <clears throat> the proxy model, essentially what we have taken, um, I should back up one step saying that the, the original Naval Research Laboratory model is also a proxy model, so the, the basic formulation of the model is unchanged, um, but we're just using uh, new observations and new proxy records to derive our updated coefficients. <laughs> so <clears throat> in a proxy model, we're essentially taking a measurement time series and regressing it against proxies of solar activity. And then from that regression, you get a scaling coefficient that can take incremental changes in those um, proxy inputs on any given, in any given day and translate them into an irradiance change. So on the left is the original NRL model um, compared to source observations early on in the source mission. So these was about six month time period and we're looking at Lyman Alpha up here and then um, uh, 1000 to 1300 nanometers in the near infrared on the bottom. And what you can see is that the original NRL model um, was able to reduce or reproduce much of the variability in the source um, observations. Um, at these rotational time scales, and we can also see 
of course, as we understand that the um, spectral radiance change from from these magnetic features uh, varies uh, quite strongly with uh, with wavelength. So, for example, um, there was a this was the October um, 2003 Halloween storm, a uh, large sunspot group, and we see a reduction in the near infrared um, radiation, um, but a corresponding um, increase in the facular brightening activity in the Lyman alpha time series that tends to kind of um, oscillate for, for a several solar rotations. So in this updated model, we're actually using the source observations from 2003 to roughly 2014. So it was 11 years of source observations. And that was our, our measurement record. And we're using the University of Bremen's uh, Composite Magnesium 2 Index as our proxy of facular brightening. And the, um, it's the uh, US Air Force um, SOON network. It stands for um, Solar Observing Optical Network. This is a network of, of ground stations that measure sunspot area and location. <clears throat> and we use that to derive a, um, a sunspot darkening function. Now, with because the uh, the long term stability of the source spectral observations are are felt to be less stable than the total irradiance observations, we actually detrend the source spectral observations prior to getting our regression coefficients. And what I'm showing on the right is then the results of this new model. Um, <clears throat> the top plot is a difference in between the source TIM observations between 2003 through 2014. This was the model training period. Um, <clears throat> and what we can see is that we have um, a zero mean difference with essentially no slope there. And uh, the darker line is a, is a one year annual smooth of that. And the bottom <clears throat> is a, I think it's roughly a year period of comparison, oh, excuse me, that should be NRL SSI 2 model, comparing the spectral estimate to the source solstice observations. And you can see that there's much in commonality between um, the features captured by the model and the observations, but that they um, do, <laughs> do diverge over the course of the year. And as I mentioned before, that, that was actually imposed in the model formulation. So, <clears throat> so just Real briefly here, the deliverables. We, the I hope point of this um, producing producing the solar radiance climate data record, of course, is to take these um, source instruments, the TIM and the SIM, and um, compute this model. So we have these coefficients, and then we can go back in time and to wavelengths that have not yet been observed from space, and construct a longer term record of the total and spectral energy. Um, coming to the Earth, because of course, the sun is their most dominant source of energy. Sorry, can I just ask that, what, what the actual inputs to the model, to the NRL? Is it just the magnetic field designation? No, we, we, use a, we use a proxy of, we use the magnesium too as a proxy of the facular brightening, and then the, uh, we drive a sunspot area and location on a given day. So we essentially just have the two inputs. that answer. So it's different than if you're familiar with the satire model, which is a semi-empirical model that um, derives, <clears throat> derives these facular and sunspot features from magnetograms. So it partitions that magnetic variability from the magnetograms. And here we're using proxies of solar activity. So it's, a, it's image based, right? I mean, otherwise you wouldn't need the central limit behavior. Image-based, intensity selection, uh, essence, the so the <clears throat> let me see if I can answer this question. It might show some of my misunderstanding. Um, so we we do not use imagery 
but the we do account for the center to limb variation in a in an empirical relation of the sunspot area and location on the disc. So we have looked at um, different assumptions in that contrast, trying to best find a mix um, a match from our proxy representation of that to the irradiance measurements, but we're using a parameterization. Um, there has been, uh, Judith has investigated in the past different um, empirical assumptions of the center to limb um, uh, dependency and <clears throat> hadn't found, um, actually probably I shouldn't say too much more because I'm, that was an area that I didn't know so much about, but Which I don't. To apply the magnesium to index? No, to apply any you know, we we uh, we don't do any changes to the magnesium. We don't. We just use a, a disc integrated magnesium irradiance. Okay. Um, the, we do evaluate, or I should say Judith has evaluated the dependency of um, sort of the, I guess she calls it the seeing of the sunspots, so where the sunspots are on the disk relative to the observer on the surface. Um, and there's so no... How does the model know where the sunspots are? We know them from the... Oh, so we're, we yeah, no, we, we've, so essentially we feed the, the model this sunspot darkening function, which has been derived using um, an assumption, an empirical assumption of sunspot area and location. Um, so we get the sunspot area and location from these network of ground um, observatories. It's input, yes, and so, yeah. No, no, that that's okay, and I'm. It's good that you asked that. Okay, did that answer your question too, then, or maybe not, or yeah. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so, um, so I'd mentioned that we're producing the the um, TSI and SSI. Uh, this is, um, we provide daily and monthly averages um, from the time period of 1882 up to present day, and then yearly averages from 1610 through present day. Uh, we also have produced a, an observational composite of TSI, and I'll, I'll go into that more later, but um, we uh, <coughs> append to that data directly with the source TIM observations. Um, <clears throat> we also provide uh, reference spectra. These are at one nanometer spectral resolution. And <clears throat> this quiet sun reference spectra, I didn't, forgot to point out on the previous slide, that, that's actually, um, uh, its mainstay is uh, source observations during a time period of minimum solar activity. It was called the whole heliospheric interval. So that is the, the, the basis of our assumption of what the quiet sun irradiance level is because, um, of course, we, we in this proxy model, we're, we're modeling the variability in the irradiance, not the absolute value. So we need to have some baseline to basically pin that variability onto. So that's why we need the quiet sun reference. And then we provide um, model estimates from um, selected periods during low, moderate, and high solar activity and output those also as a one nanometer spectral resolution and then an estimate from the Maunder minimum. Other things we do, we do give a time series of our model input. So this would be the derived sunspot darkening function um, as I described earlier and the magnesium two are, are essentially the proxy of facular brightening that we are using. Um, we've got this all documented in a, what's called a climate algorithm theoretical basis document and we have to provide stewardship for this data record in terms of um, at, at least yearly quality assurance reports. I'll talk about that. And our quarterly data that we deliver, we replace at year end with final data upon completion of this quality assurance report. So essentially our quality assurance report 
um, is is for the most part um, really uh, scrutinizing our time series of model inputs. So we compare our model inputs against independent proxies of solar activity, and, uh, and so we. On the year end, when we have checked everything out as best we can, we stamp them final and we replace our preliminary data with the final product. <clears throat> um, there's a couple different places you can get the data from the NOAA website, and you could also we also have it hosted at Last Blizzard site, which I'm sure you're familiar of. Um, I wanted to show, um, just talk briefly, because we're we're at a point where. Um, our initial data set has been released for about two years now, and we're, we have, there's of course been research advances um, in the solar community that we wanted to incorporate um, in this model. So uh, we are having an upcoming revision, version 2, revision 1, that's coming out soon. And the results that I'm going to be showing shortly are going to be from that new revision. So I just wanted to introduce um, what, we've, what we've been addressing as part of that. So the, the first one here, um, this is work that Judith Lean has done um, on the sunspot darkening index. So she was looking to see if she could improve the parameterization of the sunspot contrast with area. And <clears throat> she did this in a couple different ways. I mentioned that we're, we use this network of soon stations to, to give us the um, sunspot area and location data. And you know there's variability from station to station. So she she assessed well if we take all the stations or a subset of them, how does that impact our sunspot darkening function? And um, she also accounted to to correct to the to correct for the local time of the observations to a common time. And what she found is that um, it made little to no difference on our modeling of solar cycle variability. So we're not actually imp uh, implementing any change in our model coefficients in revision one. So uh, where we are making changes are in these next three rows. Um, the one big one is the sunspot area data sets. And on Andres knows much about this. Um, so essentially, there, there is a. Um, to go back further in time, we have to start piecing different observational data sets together. And in the sunspot area data, that was the Royal Greenwich Observatory prior to roughly 1978. And then in more recent time, these soon observations that I was talking about. And there's, there's understood to be a systematic difference between those, but there was a range of literature estimates of what that systematic difference was. And in version two, revision zero, we assumed that the um, RGO observations were 25% higher than the soon observations. And <clears throat> Judith has done some independent um, correlations with sunspot number. And she's, she's found that a 49% um, scaling, which would be a 67, basically re reducing the RGO areas by 67%, is a better fit. So um, this, for, for our revision, one, we're going to be adopting uh, a change of this systematic difference to correct these two data sets. And that, of course, is going to impact the relative weighting of our spots to faculty uh, prior to roughly 1978. And so I'll show some results of how that impacts um, our data later on. Uh, that sounds like the sunspot area is not that well defined or not a very um, you know, I think Andre should answer that question. <laughs> yes, actually, the process of writing this, there has been a lot of, I think that the problem here is how do you want to use this if you're looking at sunspot areas as an integrated quantity for the whole sun or as individual objects? And I think, so what I, what I and this is something that I've discussed with, with Adele, but I have not, I am in the process of writing it up. Basically, if you want to do irradiance, you care about a global measurement, right? And what happens is that soon threshold of observation is much higher. So, and the, 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 when you look at the distribution of, of sizes of objects, they, then when you raise your threshold of observations, you're cutting a lot of the little ones. There are many, many, many more. And so that factor that they're talking that they are talking about that they should use. Is trying to account for the fact that soon is meeting Some of these a lot of the little ones and has a larger sense of the little ones. But the thing that, that it has people one has to be careful is 
if what you care is not the integrated quantity, but the individual objects, you shouldn't apply any correction. The instruments are all consistent with each other. So once you make you apply a threshold to soon and to N, uh, and to RGO, and then you look to object individual objects, then you have to be careful because if there is any correction that needs to be made, it's not the same correction that you do when you look at the integrated uh, quantity. So that's kind yeah. of like what is going on there in those. Uh, so that that factor that is missing is actually the objects that soon doesn't see, yeah. but that. And since we derive our scaling coefficients from this modern day epoch during the source era, we we have to maintain consistency in what that incremental change is. And if we if the RGO um, data is getting these small spots, and we we need to account for that. So we need this scaling to kind of even the playing field. Um, so, so in the future, we'll be working with Andres some more to, to improve on this even further. Um, of course, there, there's been a lot of flurry about the sunspot number uh, data sets and revisions to these. Um, first one was, of course, this updated sunspot number record by the uh, SILSO, which, sorry, I'm forgetting the acronym for that, um, sunspot index and law I, no I'm not sure what that is anyways uh, these um, we have quantified the impact on these on the model TSI and SSI radiances back in historical times and so um, what we thought would be useful for the atmospheric community is is to have um, two of these historical records so from which you can kind of consider that the difference between them is an uncertainty on what that um, modeled SSI and TSI is is in the in the historical um, you know prior to 1881 or 1882 time frame and then the, the last thing is in terms of the observational composites um, in our revision zero or original um, release we uh, we created our observational composite of um, using um, based on uh, PMOD composite and ACRIM composite. We first individually scaled these to the source TIM direct observations, which are is our gold standard now for um, accuracy and precision of TSI observations, and then um, averaged those together. And then for the time period of the source epoch, we replaced that composite data with the direct source TIM observations. There's now a um, uh, composite also by the RMIB, Royal Meta Meteorological Institute of Belgium. And so we are going to be incorporating their composite as well um, in the same manner, the pro approach I just spoke about. So, so I think that's kind of all my, um, I should move along here and talk about some comparisons against the measurements and the models. And so the, I, in, in the tr introduction I talked, said I was going to make these comparisons against uh, the NASA source um, TSI and SSI observations and also to this satire model, which is this semi-empirical model that also assumes that the irradi irradiance changes are due to uh, changes in the surface magnetic field, but that they derive um, the um, distribution of the bright and dark features uh, from a magnetogram image. So let's launch into some TSI comparisons. So on, on the large pot, plot to the left is um, um, 13 or more years of the source TIM observations in purple, and in the green is our modeled output. And <clears throat> I remind you that, of course, I used uh, the model training period was from 2003 to 2000. 14, and um, we don't do any additional fitting to the source data. We derive these coefficients, and um, when using our model inputs, we estimate the radiance, and that's what you're seeing here. There isn't anything that we um, do after that to say, okay, now apply a fitting function to meet the source TIM data. So <clears throat> the top plot is just is the difference in these. Uh, records over time uh, through late 2016 um, for the NRL2 model, and in the bottom is the difference rela related to the uh, satire estimates of TSI. And you can see some similarity and dis differences between the um, how well or how not well the models recreate the measured 
um, TSI variability. So for example, in periods of maximum activity, both, <clears throat> both the models have more trouble um, capturing the full variability of the observations, and both models tend to overestimate uh, solar minimum conditions relative to the observations. But you can also see that um, there's a, there's a long-term, there's a trend in the long-term differences of the satire model that I'll talk about more um, yeah, upcoming. But our ability, so thus far we've been able to model the um, observed TSI to within the stability of the source TIM instrument. And these are some SSI comparisons from the source solstice and source SIM uh, instruments. And I've just showing uh, part of the spectrum here. Um, focusing on the left is um, primarily data from, actually this is all data from source solstice in purple over the length of the mission. And on the right is primarily source SIM. There's a little bit of source solstice here, but um, only up to about 310 nanometers. So this story here is uh, from the source SIM instrument. And um, we've, I've normalized the uh, data to match the model at 2009. And you can see the values of these uh, uh, normalization coefficients in the legend. So before I talk about uh, maybe differences in these plots that your eyes are drawn to, I just wanted to set the stage um, for the fact that, as we understand, that the variability in the sun and the spectrum is highly wavelength dependent. And um, so you can see for here in, in the Lyman Alpha, we have uh, variability reaching 60 percent um, uh, relative to the minimum conditions, dropping here to uh, to three percent, and then even less as you go out into the visible. And <clears throat> there's uh, Marty Snow is here in the room, a source solstice instrument <laughs> scientist, and uh, this is actually not I'm not showing the most recent source solstice data. He's recently come up with another. Um, uh, release of data that's even an improvement along here. And um, the fact that um, the, it's, it's unclear um, early in the mission if there's a potential that there's some um, instrument signal that's remaining in the observed record. Um, and that's um, kind of a longer, convoluted, difficult problem for Marty to untangle, and he's working on that. On the right, um, we see kind of more um, more differences in the record, and um, I've kind of, I've actually, hope you can see there's a couple points here that the source SIM instrument scientist has pointed out as being um, likely, uh, where these kinks are likely of instrumental um, origin, uh, whether it was due to a change in the operations of the instrument or even in a change in the operations of the spacecraft. Um, source has been operating for some time in a day-only operations uh, mode where the instruments are um, um, only on on the orbit uh, sun side. Um, even, and actually since December, it's now operating in something called brownout mode. So, yeah. So these, uh, these sort of different spacecraft changes affect the, the temperatures um, and other things in the instruments, and it's felt that those um, those haven't been fully corrected for in the observed record. Changes. Are you standing by this result that the change in the shorter wavelength range is opposite to the one in the longer wavelength range? Does that still hold? Uh, I think your question is more about the, are we staying by the, uh, the out of phase uh, behavior at the longer wavelengths? And, yeah. Uh, so yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm not the instrument scientist on that instrument, but I believe that yes, we, we still stand by that conclusion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so I, I wanted to, um, well, so in our modeling approach, we, we actually have a different assumption that we, we actually assume that there is um, instrumental artifacts in the 
um, particularly in the source sim observations. But I wanted to establish by this plot here, does this actually show um, solar rotational variability observed by source? Because this is what we've actually worked to capitalize on in our updated model. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is, is um, in, in these different wavelength bands, what we're showing is a comparison of the NRL model in green, source observations in purple and satire in kind of this yellow gold color. Um, all of these data sets have, um, even over a year time scale, they have slightly different trends in, in their long term. So we've detrended all of them so you can really see the, uh, the rotational variability as it's modeled and measured. And <clears throat> what, what we're seeing then is that um, and from our modeling approach, we assume these sort of features are, are in the processing, not in the, when the instrument's up there taking its measurement, it's taking, as you can see here on these solar rotation scales, we're, we're seeing, at least the, the models are agreeing with the observations. So the theoretical understanding of the sun's variability on the rotation is in agreement with the observations. And there's parts of the observations, especially in um, source sim, towards uh, certain wavelength bands that are more noisier than others. And this particular region above 1600 nanometers is a, is a different detector. Um, it's called the ESR. And it is um, unfortunately um, for two reasons, I'm not showing it here. It's, it's both noisier and it's also um, uh, because of the operations of the instrument, we don't often get a full spectrum. And I wanted to plot the whole spectrum. And so since I requested all that data, I really didn't have enough of a complete spectrum from the source of ESR to show here on this plot. But in the, in the ultraviolet and the source solstice observations, you can see, for example, that the NRL model is, is really agreeing very well with the source solstice observations, and the satire model has a slightly larger variability in the UV. So I also wanted to show some <coughs> comparisons just between this model and the satire model over longer time spans. And <coughs> this is actually... Um, this time series plot uh, exposes um, probably two to three of the no well-known differences between these two models. And the first is, if you, if you look for here, um, this, these dashed lines in each of these plots uh, denote the, the value of the um, uh, spectral radiance on the 1st of January. So you can see up here in particular that the satire model is showing that um, as you go further back in time that the irradiance isn't coming back to the same minimum, whereas um, in the NRL model we are. So there's that long-term secular trend difference. Um, we also have, as you look from UV then down here through the near-infrared, you can see that the satire model has, has more um, out of phase with TSI behavior than the NRL model. So in the excuse me, in the near-infrared uh, region, that becomes more pronounced. Um, the gray lines are, are uncertainties in our NRL estimate, and you can see here, for example, especially in the region that came from the source and ESR data, that we, we really don't feel we have a good handle on what the um, uh, variability of the sun is in the near-infrared, and so that's denoted by our, our large um, uncertainty bar. So an easier way to kind of um, evaluate this is just to look at energy differences from different um, time periods in this time series. So what I'm showing here is this interminimum difference between the NRL model and the satire model I talked about. And so this is this well-known um, difference in the long-term secular trend. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we also had know of differences um, back here even in solar cycle 21 where, um, actually this is probably too small, you can't quite see, but the um, estimated satire TSI change um, during this time period is just a little less than half of what the NRL model estimates. So, and then there's differences, of course, in how that is dispensed across the spectrum. And in the most recent time period, I wanted to show this so we could um, uh, include source data on the plot. Um, purple here is source observations and 
didn't mention, but Lyme and Alpha and each of these plots has its own separate scale because its energy difference is so small that you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from a zero line here. So what we're seeing here is that the um, given the, um, the stability of the source solstice instrument of uh, point. 5% um, per year, and if I propagate that over a six-year time frame, I have roughly a 3% uncertainty on the source observations, and I'm unable to distinguish between um, the, sort, uh, the NRL or satire estimates in the UV. So while satire estimates a higher UV or variability than the NRL, it's still within the uncertainty of the observations. Um, <clears throat> it's going to Move back to some historical. I told I talk about historical reconstructions, and the um, what we have here is a couple things going on in this plot, and this is actually results detailed in this Capital uh, Solar Physics paper. But this is where um, uh, we investigated the impacts of this new revised sunspot number record by the Silso group on the estimates of irradiance. I'm just showing the results here back to. Um, in TSI back to uh, 1600. So um, this, if you look here in the lower left first, actually, we have in black is, is the, um, the Hoyton uh, Shatton. Um, I think that's how you say it, Hoyton. Is it Shatton or Scatton? <laughs> Anyways, Shatton. OK, uh, it's a group sunspot number record. And it has been um, uh, scaled uh, such that uh, it's, it's highly correlated with the um, revised uh, Silso sunspot number record for time periods after 1882. So you can see that the, the difference, the largest difference between these two estimates are prior to 82 or 1882 or 1885. And <clears throat> what we're showing here on the right hand side then is the NRL estimates of what the historical irradiance is based on these two different sunspot number estimates. So we we only use the sunspot number in the NRL model prior to 1882, um, because up after that point, we have sunspot area and location data from the RGO or the SOON network. Um, so what you're seeing here in this collection of plots is um, differences that start to emerge prior to 1882, where we, you know, you expect differences related to the to the sunspot number data, and that you can see that using the Silso record, which is this upper collection of curves, that while the Maunder minimum-like estimates of solar radiance are not changed so much, the Silso estimate would have you coming out of that period at a, at a faster rate and to a higher value. Now, <clears throat> there's actually four curves on here, which is just simply to show the impact of our assumption in the scaling factor between of what I mentioned between um, RGO and soon. And so you can see that the, the difference that the difference is related to changing that assumption in the sunspot area time series are smaller relative to what is the impact of the sunspot number change. So, so this is what's always mystifying about this model. If you look at the Lower end of the, uh, the model, okay. uh, which, which doesn't really vary with this sunspot revision uh, significantly. Right. Um, you see a very distinct behavior. Uh, you see that the model minimum was significantly lower than our current yes. idea of our solar minimum. You see a increase during the 1900s of the uh, right. solar minimum, and then it sort of flattens out. And yet, when you show it at high resolution, it keeps like back. The NRL model is, is, is quite sure that the last several solar minima were identical. So, so what's the basis? Yeah. So oh, you know. Variation. Yeah. So, so um, right. It's only coming out of sunspot number. Yeah. Over the sunspot number record, and the sunspot number record says, well, the solar minimum sunspot goes to oh. Right, and you would expect it to be flat then. I've, I've uh, neglected to tell you a very important thing, so <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Um, uh, Judith has assumed that there is a secular change in um, facular brightening over a longer time due to um, 
ephemeral regions, emergence of ephemeral regions. And she has done some work with a colleague at NRL to, um, to essentially estimate the emergence of these ephemeral regions using a flux transport model. And so what you're seeing, the change in this back, uh, baseline, is what we call the background. So this is not related to the solar cycle behavior. So how we how we account for this or how we present this in the in the updated NRL model is that we the the magnitude of this um, change in the secular background is very speculative um, and it has a is a um, you know can range from some people say it's zero to others say it's it's you know five six watts um, yeah one reason that is that goes beyond the speculative that for example uh, these minima just after 1800 are so deep is that when you have uh, very weak cycles then you have in the minimum phase more days with zero sunspots as in solar minima between very big cycles. So the total number of days where there is no spots uh, varies quite strongly and I think that uh, gives rise to uh, judging that this minimum is deeper. The amount of days that you have for the minimum, in the turn of the century, in the 1900s, your minima were not significantly deeper than the, the, the minimum of cycle 23. They were a little deeper, but not that They deep. were a little deeper. So, that's what, so that's the question what I'm is, saying. why, if we have, if we, if we think we understand what the minimum of cycle 24, 3, what 23 was like, I mean, in terms of irradiance, we measure it and we think we have captured Right? When we go to a minimum that is as deep, why is it significantly deeper? I see what, what Stan is saying. Right? The, the amount of days is similar. Well, yeah. but before you even you know, argue the substance of it, what I'm curious about is where does that come from? I mean, this is a proxy based model, good enough, primarily sunspot when we go back in time. Uh, and so, what's, what's the source of, of the yeah, uh, let me try and tell you what I understand, but it's probably not going to be what you, so in, in, in the modern era when we've had magnesium-2 index, the assumption that Judith makes is that she has a global irradiance that represents the, the facular brightening and that there is no, I mean, that would capture any ephemeral emergence. The, my understanding of this flux transport model is that her colleague essentially used the sunspot number and some assumption of how they're distributed on the um, solar disk and then essentially estimated from this flux transport model what this sort of secular change in facular brightening would have been. And that is what is reflected in this changing background. Now she has recognized that she, uh, what she told me is that this is, is, is definitely a point of contention in, in the community. And so what we've done in this updated version is that the, the whole the magnitude of the TSI or SSI change that we're saying is this um, speculative background component, we have add that whole magnitude to our estimate of the uncertainties. So if I had plotted the uncertainties on here, you would find that they're enveloped in a range that is not inconsistent with no change, you know, like just a cycle only activity. So, um, but, you know, unfortunately, I, I just don't know enough to, to talk in any more depth about, you know, what ephemeral regions are and how they, where they come from. Um, I'll have to talk with Judith and get a little bit more knowledgeable about that, or maybe you guys can <laughs> help me figure that out. But, um, yeah, so she did mention that this was in the original model was was a was a was a source of disagreement, and this was her approach to um, both provide this estimate, but also include it in the uncertainties, 
And also, um, we, we can easily provide um, an estimate of historical radiance based on only the cycle of the sun. And so just please ask me, because I could provide that to you if you're interested in having that. Um, I'm not going very fast here. <laughs> <laughs> but this is fine. This is great. You know, we, maybe we don't get to the TESIS stuff. I'll just summarize TESIS SIM because that's the exciting stuff. Um, this um, Cop et al. paper also um, showed reconstructions uh, using the satire model that I spoke about. And <clears throat> I'm not at all an expert on the satire model, but it has different um, assumptions based on the sunspot number and how it uses a sunspot number. And so what what you're seeing here in, in this record is, again, prior to this 1880 time period, um, an even larger um, difference relative to what they would estimate based on the Hoyt and Scatton, Shatton group spot number here in blue. Um, so um, the, it's such that um, at, in periods that the historical irradiance was even larger than present day. Um, there's an additional line here that they show, which is this grain curve, and that was um, that was a another revision of the group spot, sunspot number done recently, or in like the last year or two by um, Svalgard and Shatton. And so you're seeing that that revision of the group sunspot number has more solar variability in that um, Maunder minimum period, and you can see. I wonder. Um, I don't actually show it so well, but this is the this is the fractional difference of those relative to the irradiance you would get using a Hoyt and Shatton. So I, I can't speak to to why this is, um, but um, there's different de definitely the different models use the sunspot number in different ways and have different assumptions based on the sunspot number. Any questions on that? So the um, <clears throat> Just real brief, I wanted to show our observational TSI composite for a new revision as shown here in red. And it's very, very similar to our original revision. The only difference is that we're going to be using, incorporating this um, TSI composite from the RMIB group. It's in a Belgian group. And so <laughs> it has ACRAM composite, PMI composite, and RMIB, um, both scale to source TIM and then averaged. And then in the beginning with source TIM observations, it's just the direct data there. So people say, well, why did you add another TSI composite to the mix? Well, our point was to actually provide a composite that at least only had the highest accuracy observations included in this most recent time period. Um, <clears throat> Quality assurance. So obviously, when you have a model, you're very sensitive to your model inputs. You, you want to be sensitive to your model inputs, but you're also uh, highly sensitive to uncertainties in those model inputs. And, and actually, the accuracy and precision of these proxies are largely unknown. Um, so we've devised a statistical approach that helps us monitor these proxy inputs over time to help us um, to give us a heads up or an awareness whether the um, the proxy inputs that we're using are trending differently relative to another one. So we're using um, sort of similarities in behavior and monitoring things like correlations and means and standard deviations from independent records to, to um, help us determine or basically assess the stability of our model product. And I wanted to show one example here that's um, of, of why this this um, maybe rudimentary approach has been beneficial. And so, for example, what we see here in the plot is the ratio of a magne magnesium 2 index from the University of Bremen relative to the OMI um, satellite. And this uh, dashed line is the one to one, or this is the one line here. And what you can see is a, is a, is a decrease in this. There's a, a difference in a trend, essentially, of these two magnesium 2 ratios. But we were with our operational quality assurance approach, we were actually able to pick up a difference in the trend over time of, of this um, uh, um, magnesium 2 index, um, even before we heard from, from the OMI team that they were starting to notice differences in their records. So um, it's not the, not the best thing we can do. We're still, of course, looking for 
for ways to better um, estimate the uncertainties in the model due to these proxy inputs. Uh, for now, this is what we're working with, but it's certainly an area for improvement. So um, I think what I'm going to do, just because I have um, running short on time, I'm going to just give um, really almost a two-slide summary of TSIS. Um, we're very excited about the upcoming TSIS mission. It's um, uh, scheduled to launch the Nash Space Station in November of this year. Um, TSIS is going to be making the same two measurements of source, so TSI and SSI, but it will only have um, one of the spectral instruments that SOURCE has. So, so uh, TSIS has the spectral radiance monitor, the SIM, to measure um, 200 nanometers to 2400 nanometers. And then um, the TIM instrument, um, which is also it draws heritage from SOURCE, as does the SIM instrument draws heritage from SOURCE. But I wanted to just discuss, um, you know, based on those differences that we saw between the um, uh, model and uh, over the model estimates of solar cycle variability over the long term relative to what um, source sim was observing, I wanted to show how, discuss why, what has changed in terms of this development of the TSIS sim instrument and why um, we're going to be able to achieve essentially an order of magnitude improved accuracy in the observations. And it's really due to extreme um, efforts. Um, Eric Richard here is the TSIS sim instrument scientist that they've been doing um, in terms of design and also calibration, characterization on the ground. So <clears throat> source here, here's TSIS. Um, the first thing is, is a big effort in terms of um, um, reducing degradation in the instrument or being better able to quantify degradation in the instrument by including a third channel. So essentially these will be operated as duty cycle instruments very similar to the, to the um, operations of the TIM instrument where you have one channel observing the sun uh, on a frequent basis and you open up a backup channel less frequently and you know you're assuming that um, uh, changes in the irradiance measured between the primary and the backup are then due to degradation on the primary. So you can correct the primary. And then we have a third channel that is used approximately once a year that will be used to correct the backup channel. So we have the three channels. Um, we have, uh, they spent a lot of efforts improving the noise characteristics of the ESR. Um, the ESR is the detector that measures long word of 1600 nanometers, where the source SIM ESR was, uh, was, was noisier. Um, that's uh, big efforts on there, so that, that's a great improvement. And then they did um, absolute, absolute calibrations of the irradiance um, that they've, um, Eric and, um, people in the calibration uh, division there at um, LASP, Ginger Drake and Dave Harbour and others developed this, uh, what they call the um, uh, CIRCUS, or S LASP Spectral Radiance Facility. Um, and I can show just one picture of their setup here, where essentially they are using um, a cryogenic radiometer as the uh, standard, it's a NIST standard, and then um, a series of lasers that cover the spectral range of the SIM to uh, compare the output measured from SIM to this cryogenic standard. And I wanted to show you just how well they've done. So this is, there's a lot of, um, a lot of work that went into this plot. And what you're seeing here is across the spectral range of the SIM instrument. They've, they've done such a good job of characterizing each individual component of the TSIS SIM measurement equation that they're essentially able to predict what the output from this cryogenic radiometer would be to within 0.2%. So that's the order of magnitude improvement from the source SIM observation. So it's a real heroic achievement. So, uh, those are the pictures of the instruments. We're ready for flight. And I'm going to conclude um, 
maybe instead I'll just provide actually an outlook. So I won't rehash all the stuff I talked about today, but just to give some kudos to the um, source team that uh, how their data has been, helped improve the NRL models. Um, we're excited about the future thesis observations to improve our parameterizations of solar radiance variability. Um, there's a couple things here that we're interested in doing into the future, and one of them is developing a high spectral resolution proxy model, and I was wondering if this is of interest to anybody here, or if you may have any feedback for me or other suggestions for improvement, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Sorry, I went long. <laughs> When you look at all these boxes and how they correlate with each other, you have also dependence on the sampling cycle. Say again, sorry. Uh, uh, the way in which all these plots relate to each other, you see that the correlation is not constant over time, but they change depending on the sampling cycle. So, do you take that into consideration in, in any way, or it's just really based on the social anatomy? In, well, I mean, we, so we are essentially taking, I mean, I guess one answer to your question, I think this is what you're asking. We developed are these scaling coefficients from the 2003 to 2014 timeframe. So you're asking, okay, what if we had done those scaling coefficients at another cycle? Um, yeah, no, we, we are, we actually, that's an open question. Would those scaling coefficients be the same? And we can't say. Um, we're, of course, that's one of the reasons why we're quite excited for you know a longer record of highly precise solar radiance observations because we can start to investigate. Or is our assumption that these scaling coefficients from cycle to cycle are the same? You know, um, but it could, we could be wrong. Yeah. So, as I understand the effort is that you have now a certain length of record where in space the total irradiance, say, has been uh, changed, has been observed, and you have then a variety of ground-based observations of the appearance of the solar disk terms of sunspots, uh, factula, and network, and what have you. And then there's been developed a methodology to deduce from the disk appearance proxies that uh, kind of characterize the state of activity, and these proxies then are mapped against the actual irradiance variations as matter mm -hmm. from space. And in doing this for uh, various phases of the activity, the hope was to gain a measure uh, to how accurate the, this proxy modeling can possibly be, and then going back in time where you only have proxies, first a hundred years, uh, say mm -hmm. where you have Mount Wilson pictures or, or things like that, uh, and then going even, going back even further. Now I would assume that uh, you can sort of quantify how well you do for by now for the time where you have the, the actual measurements. You can then deduce a certain expectation accuracy for the last 100 years, and then with a higher uh, 
uh, uncertainty going back further. Could, could, could one summarize that in this way? Yes, I mean, I. I think what you're asking is, I mean, and, and that was kind of our approach, is to use the very best observations we can to derive these relationships with proxies. And then going back in time, the uncertainties grow. Yeah. For certain. And not, and you know, and not, um, so, I mean, actually, you know, what you raise is a good point. We. <laughs> We haven't really, as of yet, um, we, we're assuming that our model inputs are have a, a relative uncertainty of 20%, which seems fairly conservative. But as you go back in time, it 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 may be an underestimate. Uh, but we've kind of saying, you know, that irrespective of whether we have a proxy in um, in in. Uh, 1900 relative to a space instrument of 2014, um, we're saying both of them are encompassed within a 20% uncertainty in their relative, and we, we propagate that through into our estimates of their radiance yeah. uncertainty. For example, one way of sort of sorting this out uh, could be to see whether you are skill is better at low solar activity as compared to the actual space oh. measurement than at times of high activity. Oh, so you're thinking or like... Whether you're uh, better at the rise of the cycle than at the decline of the cycle. So maybe, so you're suggesting if we investigated how our scaling coefficients perform, whether we, we took a, yeah. from a, yeah. Um, you know, I I haven't looked at that. Um, I can certainly do that. I it's not, I don't know if if uh, Judith has looked at that in that way precisely, but um, but it's certainly something to consider. I'm I'm assuming that if we uh, tried our approach just strictly at solar minimum activity, I think we would have not as good of a um, re uh, regression. I think between our um, irradiance measurements and the solar proxies, that would be my guess, but um, actually maybe I should back off on that because we, as, a, as we get to higher activity we have even larger uncertainties on our proxy input, so, um, so I have to think about that. Yeah. Right. So uh, TSIS is going to get launched from the ISS? It's going to launch to the ISS. Okay. Yeah. And it's going to Stay so there. The okay. It is so. That's it's uh, actually probably Eric could talk more about this, but um, it's being uh, it's it's it basically launched in uh, a trunk of the <laughs> SpaceX Dragon, on on it kind of um, locked on, if you will, to um, to a platform, mm -hmm. and then a robotic arm comes and it pulls that whole contraption out of the Dragon trunk, and it basically. This, this platform it's locked into has, has even all the electrical conduits through there and essentially snaps it into place like a Lego piece to the frame of the International Space Station. And so what you're seeing here um, is, is this frame attachment here. I believe if I'm looking at the image right, and then, the, and then there is, um, because, um, so because there's astronauts at the space station, um, the, the, and, and because the space station has this huge bulk, we have to essentially lift the instruments up above the bulk of the space station so that they can see the sun unimpeded or, or out of glint zones and stuff as well. And then we have to be able to stow the instruments away when the astronauts want to meander about the space station so that they don't get caught up on a moving piece. So essentially this, this, uh, this arm kind of lifts, lifts the instruments up and then, and then there's a, a, a pointing system that tracks the sun and um, is very, very highly engineered to actually also damp um, motions. There's, there's basically a jitter in the space station and it has different frequencies and this um, pointing system is quite extravagant. It's very exciting. If you want to come to LASPEN, you can see it. <laughs> um, I should have put a movie in here because it's really 
an engineering achievement, I, I think. You know, it's really fun to, you know, and yeah. <laughs> oh. So, uh, why put it on the ISS? I mean, there was also big problems with yeah, uh, no, it wasn't light and heating and as oh. as can. Yeah. <laughs> Right. This or, this or nothing. Yeah, it wasn't the first choice, <laughs> but they did a lot of trade studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which also handles the temperature variations yeah. as well. It's it's a very controlled environment. I mean, well, it's. Did you learn from LIGO for the isolation? <laughs> yes. An astronaut running on a treadmill is going to affect them. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why we had to get all the inputs and design the project back on. So, are there any advantages in terms of being able to service the instrument? Well, we tried to get them to bring them back after mission life so we could study the degradation. That was cost prohibitive. So, no, there's really no advantage. <laughs> it's, it's better than in the clean room. It's better to get it in space. Right. Yeah. We can see, but we've taken all the precautions to keep the instrument stable and clean. Ten years ago, this wouldn't have been an option because the space shuttle is a very dirty environment. And when it comes, so it opens the door. That was going to be a, a nightmare. But, um, the environment around the station now is cleaner. Well, there was there was another instrument though on it that um, that was a spectral instrument that um, over a few years or four years or something um, had uh, didn't experience um, what is called raids or something. Do do you remember Peter talking about? I don't. I shouldn't speak more. But they, there was another spectral observing instrument up there that they were concerned about degradation with. And um, there are particle counters basically with the space station, and they kind of monitor the n the number of particulates, and and they they showed that that was within like under a certain level, which um, is uh, the trade study showed thesis and would be fine with. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, uh, I have a kind of a methodology question about continuing to do these kind of measurements from lower orbit. One of several outcomes is going to happen with measurements of the new instrument. You're going to find something. You either agree with or disagree with it and all that stuff. Then what do you do? Um, because it, it's, it's not clear to me that, that this will definitively answer the question as to whether there is an average phase matrix to the uh, solar spectral rays. So I wanted to ask you instead, um, you know, a couple of years ago, Ricky Eglin and I proposed putting a as a hitch, just giving a ride on a geosynchronous orbit mission to sort of uh, inflate the globe at some time into space and to observe that from the ground. So it's nice to observe the stars, much in the way that solstice does. Then you have no, absolutely no, uh, you have the sensitivity to do this with a humanly fast teleport. I'm just wondering if you thought your reaction to that statement is. You, you know, um, well, um, so. I think I would say, I, th I would first say that um, in addition to the design changes for TSIS SIM, there's a lot of effort being put in the um, operations of the instrument. And um, it's felt that uh, some, some of the de difficulties in correcting the source SIM record could be based on how it was operated early in its mission. So source SIM wasn't actually initially designed to be a duty cycling instrument between the two channels. Um, they actually had something called a periscope that they, you know, could pop up and divert the light came from one channel and send it right to the next and do a direct transmission comparison. Um, <clears throat> they did as a result, they were, they were using this periscope quite frequently and very, um, the backup channel, what became the backup channel was used a lot, so not uh, kept pristine. And um, by the time, um, as time went on, they found it quite difficult to um, correct for what I think are optical aberrations in this periscope. And um, 
So they had to kind of change their whole processing plan and kind of begin on a certain day and say, okay, now we're going to operate it like a duty cycle. But the backup channel had been degraded. And so some of the, the I think that, you know, in the uh, Batista Sim and Eric had talked to this too, is spending a, a lot of time thinking and just trying to um, anticipate problems and how would we operate the TSA SIM um, and keep a very consistent solar exposure ratio times on these different channels. And um, so uh, we've got the three channels and we're going to have this consistent operations approach that's going to be very different than source SIM. Um, but that is no guarantee that we won't have a surprise. So for example, if there's non-degradation related uh, change, um, our due to cycle approach won't capture that. In terms of, you know, I, I'm, I don't know much about your proposed method with your colleague, and so I don't really have a statement about that. But. The way to stabilize, if you leave the geosynchronous orbit, it's a very, very clean environment. Okay. There's nothing to change the albedo of the object on a time scale of about 50 to 100 years. So oh. all the low Earth orbit contamination problems go away. All you get is you get so few particles out there. And are you impacted by contamination that be on your instrument and travels out there? No it's in the oh, earth oh, you observe it from the ground. oh! And it's, it's received you know, incredibly negligible amount of attention. Well, how about things. how about in terms of like your solar, uh, your Earth atmosphere variability, and and how about the if you were observing this globe from the ground? Oh, but that, that's taken care of. Uh, sorry, the. That's already got 40 years worth of, uh, of uh, work showing you can do it at the level of about less than 0.1%. Oh. So that's that's taken care of by doing simultaneous measurements of the globe against the background ensemble of stars. Huh. That's well known. I'm just surprised that it, yeah. it hasn't, this paper hasn't yeah. more interest it because it can solve the problem of 100 year climate change. Whereas I think a string of a string of instruments like this will never do that. You'll never get there. Mm. It might do it because you, you're always in low Earth orbit and you've got the contamination problem. And, uh, mm. You know, it's, it's a bit of a thing. Mm. So of course, one thing that required from UV the uh, UV just causes photo electrons to be ejected from the surface, mm -hmm. and there's no chemistry because there's nothing there. If you put a steel, or, uh, okay. Take a look. I wasn't aware. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>